our last piece of field theory for now is magnetism and the magnetic fields. And just a little disclaimer, uh, magnetic fields are a little bit more complicated than electric fields. And if you think back, electric fields are a little bit more complicated than gravity fields. Gravity is all about mass. It takes mass to create a field, but we've only got one kind of mass. And the mass typically doesn't change. Electricity and electric fields are a little bit more complicated. Charge creates the electric fields, but we've got two kinds of charge. Historically, they called them positive and negative. And charge can move around. We could have an object that was neutral all of a sudden become positive or negative. For example, there's a little simulation of it here. Uh, check it out. But uh, that simple experiment of rubbing a balloon on your sweater and then sticking the balloon to a wall. The balloon was neutral, but when you rubbed it on the sweater, electrons leave the sweater and go to the balloon. It kind of depends on the materials. I'm typing it to match the simulation. That means that the balloon, since it's picked up electrons, becomes negative, and the sweater, if we cared about it, the sweater becomes positive. Generally speaking, walls are connected to the ground. They're grounded. They're always neutral. But if you bring the negative balloon close to the wall, it induces a charge in the wall. It pushes electrons away from that little bit of wall that's close to the balloon. So that chunk of wall, since we've pushed electrons away, that chunk of wall becomes positive. Opposites always attract. So now our negative balloon is close to a positive wall. The balloon will stick to the wall. That's kind of uh, a neat wrinkle with electricity that we don't get with gravity. And it's very similar to an effect we get with magnetism. Magnetism is definitely more complicated. There's two different models to explain what creates magnetism. Uh, we're going to talk about that next. We're going to do a simpler model, more on that later. Um, whatever model we use, magnets always have two poles, two opposite ends. Historically, magnets were used to navigate. So they used navigational terms to describe the two ends of a magnet. They called them North, Sol, North Pole and South Pole. They could have called them positive and negative, but that didn't really make sense for the application they were using the magnets for. They were using them to navigate, know where North was and South was, so they called the two ends of a magnet North Seeking and South Seeking. A little bit more complicated than electricity. Electricity, you can have just a negative or a positive, but for magnetism, you can't have just a North or just a South. Every magnet, regardless of shape or style, Every magnet always has both poles. If you had like a simple bar magnet as a kid, or maybe still do, if you take a regular old bar magnet and cut it in half, you get two smaller magnets, each one with a north and south. You don't get one half that's all north and one half that's all south. You just get two smaller versions of the thing you start off with, a north and south pole on the one, a north and south pole on the other. Similar to electricity, just like charge can come and go, Objects can be magnetic or not magnetic and change between the two. Some objects are always magnetic. We gave them the clever name of permanent magnets. That's like the things that are stuck to your fridge. Some objects are magnetic when other objects are nearby. Just like the example of that balloon by the wall. The charged balloon went near a neutral wall that made the wall charged and then the balloon stuck to the wall. Similarly, the material like a common material like your fridge, or if we were in school, the whiteboard. Metals like that aren't actually magnetic. Like your fridge isn't magnetic. The whiteboard at school isn't magnetic. But if you bring a permanent magnet close by, that induces magnetism in the fridge so that the magnet is attracted to the fridge. Kind of like the balloon-induced charge, a permanent magnet can induce magnetism. So some materials go from being non-magnetic and when a permanent magnet's close by, they switch to being that magnet. So here's where we're at. We know that mass is created, mass creates gravity. <clears throat> we know charge creates electricity, but we don't have a good idea of what makes a magnet. Well, maybe you do. Here's what we're going to roll with, though. There are two models for magnetism. There's a nice complicated model that fits uh chemistry theory, outer shell electrons, and things like that. That's the model that you're going to learn in chemistry class. There's a simpler model that works for us, 
or as far as we're going with magnetism, we don't need the complicated model. So we're going to use a simple model that's based on particle theory. So way back in grade nine, depending who your teacher was, sometimes you had to memorize like the particle nature of matter. All matter is made of particles. The particles are indivisible, yada, yada, yada. I'm not big on memorizing. I don't have them, uh, but you could look them up if you really care. But here's how particle matter is going to help us through this. We're going to say that all matter is made of particles, so particle theory. What we're going to add is that these tiny particles themselves behave like little tiny bar magnets. So inside of every material are the particles, and the particles themselves kind of behave like tiny bar magnets. If those tiny bar magnets point in just completely random directions, then those tiny magnets kind of cancel each other out, and that object isn't magnetic. But if we've got a material where the tiny magnets, these tiny particles, all generally point in the same direction, then the bigger object is a magnet. So a nice graphic I stole off the internet on the left. Uh, they call them domains, but these little chunks of the material, if they're pointing in all sorts of directions, so maybe to the left over here, then there's some pointing to the right down here, uh, some pointing kind of upward here, some pointing kind of downward over here, all these opposite directions kind of cancel each other out and have the effect that this object doesn't build up any magnetic properties. This one over here, they've almost made it too perfect. All of these little regions have these little tiny particles. We call them dipoles sometimes. All the magnet, tiny magnets inside this bigger material, they all point the exact same direction. Since they agree and kind of combine, we say that this is a magnetic material. Um, what's nice about this theory is it kind of explains why some magnets get weaker over time. Maybe if you drop them or heat them up, um, if these little magnets are all perfectly aligned, it's magnetic. But if they get knocked out of alignment, maybe instead of pointing straight up, some are pointing kind of on a funny angle. Like maybe this group in here, they're pointed on an angle. Maybe this group, they're pointed on a funny angle. Maybe there's a group over here that are pointed the completely wrong way. But overall, they all tend to be pointing up somewhat except for this one guy that's pointing downward. We don't get a complete canceling out, but maybe a little bit of canceling out, then it's still gonna be a magnet. It's just not as strong of a magnet. So as simplistic as this particle model is, it explains why things are a magnet. Their dipoles are lined up. So a permanent magnet, their dipoles are lined up and they're locked in the lined up position. A material like a fridge or a whiteboard, they start off random, not magnetic, but when a permanent magnet's close by, they rearrange themselves and they become lined up. So they become a magnet. Then when you take the permanent magnet away from the whiteboard or pull it off your fridge, your fridge goes back to being non-magnet. Those dipoles go back to not being lined up. Those little magnets inside of your bigger material, they randomize again. So a simple model, but it works nicely. Oh, I kind of said it out loud, but here, bad page break. The tiny magnets are called dipoles, and those regions that were drawn in there, they are sometimes called domains. I've said all this out loud. You can read through this. In a permanent magnet, they're lined up, and they're kind of locked in their lined up orientation. In something like wood or plastic, they're random and locked into random. In a material like your fridge or the whiteboard, they're not lined up but they're allowed to switch and become lined up and switch and go back to being random. All right. Gravitational field lines pointed in the direction an imaginary mass was pushed or pulled. Electric field lines were in the direction an imaginary positive was pushed or pulled. We need a similar rule to come up with the direction for the magnetic field. In this case, what they decided is, imagine we have another magnet or another like little compass for navigating, the direction of the magnetic field is the direction that the arrow, the north pole of another small magnet or another small compass would point. So it's tight there, I didn't hold that there, word that very well out loud. Let's say we had just a old school bar magnet. If you held the compass near the north pole of that bar magnet, then the north pole of the compass would be repelled away from that end of the magnet. If you took the same compass and moved it near the south pole of the bar magnet, the north pole of your compass would be attracted to that end of the bar magnet. 
What this means is that since your compass pointed away from the North Pole, that means magnetic field lines always point away from the North Pole of a bar magnet. And since it attracted to the South Pole, that means magnetic field lines always point towards the South Pole of a bar magnet. Here is a diagram to show it. So imagine putting a little compass over here somewhere. If you put it there, the North Pole would point away from that North Pole. If you put the compass over here, the North Pole would point away from that one. If you put it down here somewhere, the North Pole would attract to the south and point that way. Put it over here, the North Pole would attract and point that way. If you put it beside it for some reason, it would point, in this case, straight down. This classic butterfly shape 